Returning to our top story tonight, the threats and counter threats between Pyongyang and Washington. Joining me now are Abraham Denmark, a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for East Asia, and Mike Chinoy, a former senior Asia correspondent for CNN. He has visited North Korea 17 times and is now a senior fellow at the University of Southern California's U.S. China Institute. And we welcome both of you to the news hour. Abe Denmark, let me start with you. Given what has happened in the last 24, 48 hours, how do you size up the situation right now between the U.S. and North Korea? I think we're at a bit of, a, bit of an inflection point that um, both Kim Jong un and President Trump have elevated the, the tension in terms of rhetoric between the two sides, yet the policies that the two sides um, have been on have not radically changed. Kim Jong un and North Korea have been conducting um, ballistic missile tests at a relatively regular pace. Um, and the on-the-ground policies that the United States has been pursuing has also been fairly consistent. The real change here has been changes in, in the rhetoric, yeah. um, with Kim Jong-un Kim Jong um, putting out very strong statements, uh, as well as President Trump making his very strong statements. Um, and so the question there is, what happens after these statements have been made? And that's what I want to ask you about. And just quickly, you follow the region, uh, the East Asia region, very closely. How is all this being received there? There's a great deal of concern um, amongst our, our allies. Uh, there's concern that the, the messaging out of the Trump administration has been fairly chaotic, uh, in that different senior officials are, are speaking about different policy positions. So there's a lot of questions about where the United States really is when it comes to North Korea. Um, and there's also broader concerns and I think deeper concerns about how the United States is going to handle a North Korea that's making very steady progress in developing a robust, credible nuclear capability that is able to reach the United States. Mike Shinoy, again, this is an area you follow so closely. We talked about how many times you visited North Korea, the North Korean mainland. How do you see this uh, situation right now? Well, I think what the North Koreans are doing has been quite predictable. They have believed for many years now that the best way to guarantee their security is to have a nuclear uh, and a missile capability that would deter the United States. And this dates back a long, long time. It was reinforced in the early 2000s when the North Koreans saw the U.S. invade Iraq and topple Saddam Hussein, who didn't have nukes. They saw Libya's Muammar Gaddafi overthrown. He had voluntarily abandoned his nuclear program. So the North is really committed to this. They've just accelerated, I think, in the last couple of years, the pace at which they're doing it. Uh, I think one of the big questions is how the North Koreans are going to respond to the very confusing signals coming from Washington. Secretary of State Tillerson uh, has mentioned talks, but President Trump is talking in very, very forceful and extreme language. And so I think there is a risk, because I don't think the North is going to change its approach, of a misunderstanding leading to some kind of conflict. Why do you believe there's a risk of a misunderstanding? Well, the North Koreans are sitting there, uh, and, and they're going to respond to threats from the United States uh, with a full speed ahead, because that's just their style. This is not a system or a regime or a leadership that's going to bow to that kind of external pressure. And if they fear that uh, the very strong language from President Trump means the U.S. might, in fact, be considering some kind of preemptive strike, then it's possible they will calculate uh, that they need to strike first. But I think there is one other point that gets lost uh, in all of the uh, inflammatory headlines, which is the North Korean position continues to be that they will not give up their nuclear or missile capabilities unless the U.S. abandons what Pyongyang calls Washington's, quote, hostile policy. And I think if you parse the North Korean rhetoric, what that there might still be an opening for some kind of negotiations. But again, that depends in large part on whether the very the, the extreme level of confusion in the signals from Washington is clarified in a way that would suggest the U.S. is interested in talks, and right now that's not at all clear. Well, and as we are sitting here uh, talking ourselves, I'm told uh, by our producer that the wires report that North Korea is now saying that they will have a plan to attack Guam by the middle of August. Uh, they go on to call what President Trump has been saying, in their words, is a load of nonsense, and they are also saying that only absolute force can work with President Trump. Um, Abe Denmark, what does this tell you about what the United States is dealing with and what our allies in the region are dealing with? 
We're dealing with a country in North Korea that has a very clear idea of what it wants to do. Uh, it sees the development of a nuclear capability as essential to the preservation of, of its regime, and it's willing to, ba to bear sin significant costs in the pursuit of that in terms of diplomatic isolation, severe economic sanctions. Um, they're continuing to make progress on that. So the question is, how do we get them off of that path? Um, in terms of the threats that they've been making about Guam, there's actually quite a few steps that they have and other options that they have between where we are now with the elevated rhetoric um, and actually conducting strikes against the United States. What do you mean? We've seen um, in the past North Korea doing several things, um, uh, attacks against South Korea uh, on the DMZ, uh, sinking a ship in the Yellow Sea, as you may recall, several years ago, um, which in the past was able to demonstrate, they were able to demonstrate to their own people that they're strong, that they're able to um, attack South Korea, but it did not es escalate into a war. Um, and the question now is, what options is North Korea considering, uh, really considering beyond this, this threatening rhetoric about Guam, uh, and how will the United States and our allies respond to that? Mike Chinoy, the question one hears from, from a number of people is, is, are the North Koreans suicidal in their attitude? Because one assumes that if, if they were to take any sort of military strike or the kind we're discussing here right now, the threat against Guam, something in the region, that there would be uh, a return strike that would hit directly at the leadership of, of the North Korean government? I don't think the North Koreans uh, are suicidal, and I think you have to be very careful in assessing North Korean rhetoric, because if you look at the history, going back a long, long time, the North Koreans are masters of incendiary rhetoric. Brins brinksmanship is the cornerstone of the way they approach uh, the rest of the world. It, it, these kinds of threats uh, keep their adversaries off balance. They feel it gives them the initiative. But I don't think you can always take it literally. I recall, for example, in the spring of 1994, when tensions were high over the North's then uh, nascent nuclear program, a uh, North Korean official said that they would turn Seoul, the South Korean capital, into a sea of fire. But four months later, after former U.S. President Carter visited North Korea, there would have been an agreement for the first ever summit me meeting between the North and the South, although it didn't happen because North Korean leader Kim Il-sung died. So I wouldn't, just because the North Koreans talk about attacking Guam, I wouldn't take that literally, although as a military planner, you obviously right. have to take all contingencies into account. But don't assume that their rhetoric is means that they're actually going to do everything they threaten to do. So we can't know, Abe Denmark, just quickly here, finally, what the Trump administration is going to do. But if you're in their shoes right now, do you respond in kind with another, with escalated rhetoric, or do you try to calm things down? I, I think you do two things. Uh, rhetorically, I would try to calm things down. Uh, President Eisenhower, um, would practice this. When Khrushchev's rhetoric would get more and more escalated, his rhetoric would get more and more calm, and that gave a great sense of, of strength to our, to our allies and to our, our adversaries. Um, but I would also do a lot more on the ground in terms of enhancing our ability to deter North Korea and to reassure our allies. We have extremely strong alliances in Japan and with South Korea, and there's a lot we can do there to demonstrate to North Korea that we have a great deal of capability and will to act. Um, and that would also send a message to our allies that we're there for them, uh, that we're reliable, and that we're capable. Abe Denmark, Mike Chinoy, we thank you both.